I'd like to welcome you to the Ventura County Planning Commission. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order for May 2nd, 2019. Uh, would the clerk please call roll? Commissioner White? Here. Commissioner McPhail? Here. Chair Dukas? Here. Commissioner King? Here. Commissioner Rodriguez? Here. Now, please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is the time set aside for public comments. This is uh, comment cards on anything that's not on the agenda. I've got no cards. Moving on. Approval of minutes for March 28, 2019. So moved. Um, before we have a second and a vote, um, I noticed that there was um, a typo that said that the vote was 4-1 instead of 4-0. We had an, abs an abstention. That's the only um, error I found. Could we have a, a second? I'll second with the amendment. Thank you. And as soon as our screens come up. Just a moment. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, now for item number six, case number PL 18 0127. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Christina Boero of planning staff. Uh, before you today is a request for a variance from the applicant, Dr. Cowan, who is here today. Um, before I begin, I also want to let you know that we have staff uh, from the uh, Public Works Transportation Department and also code compliance staff here to answer any questions that you may have about the project. So as I mentioned, bef uh, before you today is a request by the applicant to, uh, to allow a variance to occur. Uh, for to allow the existing concrete wall to remain in its current location, which is in the front setback and at the current height, and also within the um, within the clear sight triangle. The project site is located in Hollywood Beach, in the unincorporated area of Ventura. The parcel size is approximately 0 0.05 acres. Uh, Looking, stepping back, the area in, uh, of this neighborhood has approximately 78 parcels, which are, um, a majority of them are rectangular in size and of a larger size uh, square footage wise than the subject parcel. Um, just to figure out what the setbacks are, because this is a, a irregularly shaped lot, it's a reverse corner lot. And per the coastal zoning ordinance, a reverse corner lot is when the, the rear of the of the parcel uh, abuts uh, side of another parcel. So uh, looking at this slide, the front is where the F is, that is along Playa Court. The side, and the setback for that is 20 feet per the ordinance. The side setback is five feet and the side setback is the longer portion of the parcel along Santa Ana. And the rear of the parcel, the setback is six feet per the ordinance, and that is here designated with the R. So in general terms, the um, area of Hollywood Beach, the zoning would be residential beach harbor, and that basically is a designation that, that allows for um, small beach, house, beach houses with um, a large, uh, dense area. Um, the coastal zoning, it, it is located in the coastal area plan, 
and that coastal area plan designation is residential high, 6.1 to 36 dwelling units per acre, so it is a densely populated area. And the general plan designation is existing community, urban reserve. So for some um, points of interest, the project site is located uh, surrounding the Channel Islands Harbor, which is east of the site, and Hollywood Beach in the Pacific Ocean west. So before I get into the variance, I want to um, alert you to what the existing setting is for the project. So the picture to my, to my left is a picture of the existing dwelling. Um, you see that there is a control stop with a stop sign and a stop bar. And this is the wall in question. It is uh, the project site and the parcel is located um, on the corner of Playa and Santa Ana. So the wall is surrounding that property. So the picture on my right is uh, the wall looking uh, from Playa Court, and, with, and that is within the front setback. Here. And this is just another picture of the wall that is uh, looking, on, looking when you're standing on Harbor Boulevard and Santa Ana looking towards the Pacific Ocean. So there is a short permit history for the site. Um, the site was, con the dwelling was constructed with a ministerial zoning clearance in 1976. And the wall, so this, so the next few um, points are just for the wall um, and the, um, and where we came up to this point with the variance and um, the violations. So in 2004, the applicants, Dr. Cowan, purchased the property. Um, in the staff report, uh, Code compliance determined that the wall was built um, at between 1989 and 2004. The, in September of 2007, an alleged violation was issued for the property, and that was for the construction of the wall, um, construction of the wall that is over three feet in height and within the front setback. In December of 2007, the applicant submitted a pre-submittal application, and this application is, and the letter is included in it as Exhibit 8 of your staff report. The, the pre-submittal application was basically a request by the applicant to provide guidance on how the wall could remain on the site in its current con in condition at that point. So staff uh, analyzed the project and, and the uh, viability of the wall being on the site and determined that um, a variance was required to allow the wall to remain because it was not consistent with the development standards of the coastal zoning ordinance. Um, the, the letter does say that you need that the applicant needed to um, submit a variance application and provide um, reasoning and documentation for why the wall would remain. Um, unfortunately, the applicant did not do that. And in um, 2008, in December, uh, the code compliance staff issued a notice of violation on the property and uh, shortly thereafter a notice of non-compliance which is a lien on the property was uh, recorded on the property because there was no uh, any there was not anything done to uh, alleviate the situation but in 2018 in October the applicant submitted their variance application which is the application before you today and the time frame to abate that violation what is actually, there's that typo on the uh, slides, it's not November 20, 2018, it is, it is November 8th, 2009. So compliance agreement is a contract between the county and the applicant to um, allow them to uh, submit their application and do everything they need to do to um, alleviate the violation and that includes getting building permits and a zoning clearance. Mm -hmm and um, allowing, and should your commission allow the variance to happen, then they would need to get that as well. So going into what the project is, as I stated before, the applicant is requesting um, the a variance to allow the wall to remain in um, the required set front setback and adjacent to Playa Court and Santa Ana to allow it to remain in the clear site triangle and at the current height, which is the county has determined to be five feet, 11 inches at height, in height. So this is just a slide of what the 
uh, site plan elevations are that were provided by the applicant. So the Coastal Zoning Ordinance has specific standards regarding uh, fences, walls, and hedges, and setbacks. And as I've mentioned several times, the front setback is 20 feet per the zoning ordinance. Um, specifically for fences, walls, and hedges, um, the zoning ordinance prohibits walls, um, specifically, that are over three feet in height and uh, that are adjacent to a street. So that is the situation here. The wall is adjacent to Playa Court and Santa Ana Avenue. Uh, the zoning ordinance also uh, prohibits um, walls within the clear side triangle. So if the variance um, is, um, is approved today, uh, the variance would allow the concrete wall to remain in the front setback at the current height of five feet, 11 inches and within the clear side triangle. So Public Works uh, Transportation Department went out to the site, they did a site inspection and, and evaluated uh, the safety of the intersection uh, in terms of um, the wall and, the, and whether there was a view obstruction with the wall in the current location. Um, the, the, the verbiage on, on my left is what the ordinance um, is, what the ordinance uh, looks to for what the site triangle is, specifically for structures and vegetation within the clear site triangle. But to explain in general terms what the site triangle is and how it relates to this property, um, I'm going to explain what, what the situation is. So the photo, um, the aerial photo on my, on my right, you see that the project site is located in the corner of Playa Court and Santa Ana Avenue. The project site is basically a triangle, triangular parcel. Um, there is a controlled stop, and you can see the stop bar here. So when the car appro uh, vehicle approaches the stop sign, they stop um, legally at the stop bar or just, just um, before the stop bar. Then they can inch out to the ribbon in the, uh, in the corner here, this area. And th that allows them to see where have a clear sight of, of the oncoming traffic from the east and the west. So with all that together, the transportation department confirmed that the site distance is adequate even though the project site is within, and the wall is it within the clear sight triangle. There is adequate distance for vehicles to stop and pause and look to see um, oncoming traffic from the right. So according to the transportation standards, they use the standards from um, AASHTO, that the site distance from looking towards uh, Channel Islands Harbor is 280 feet, and that's uh, way above the minimum standards. And from look, when you make a right uh, left turn, that is 240 feet of site distance that they have. And again, we have transportation staff here that can um, talk more technically about the site triangle and how it, it, that affects the property. So there are five variance findings that are required to be met in order for a variance to be um, recommended for approval by staff. Uh, in, in general terms, these are that the, um, that the requested variance, well, that the parcel is, has a special circumstance or characteristic that renders it unable to fully enjoy the development of the property uh, as opposed to the surrounding areas. Um, that if the granting of the variance does not confer a special privilege um, just for that parcel, um, that the that granting of the variance will not be, that, that basically that the property has um, hardships or practical difficulties that don't allow it to fully enjoy the use of the property, and that it's not a public health and safety, safety issue, and that it's consistent with the LCP. So the applicant provided very detailed information about why he believes that the variance should be um, recommended for approval. That is included in the analysis, uh, included in the staff report. Staff analyzed these findings, these, this um, information, and determined that um, the variant, and determined and recommended that the variance be, um, be approved today by your commission. 
So I, as I mentioned before, the residential beach harbor zoning designation is basically for small lot, lots that are, have a beach-oriented uh, residential community. Specifically for this lot, um, and the reason why staff has um, recommended approval of the variance is because a majority of the lots in this area, and as I mentioned, there's about approximately 78 parcels within this area um, surrounding Pacific Ocean and um, Ch Channel Island Harbor, is that a majority of the lots are rectangular in size and 70 feet by 35 feet in, in, de in design. The subject lot, however, is irregularly shaped. It's a triangular lot um, with two roads and um, intersecting at, that, at the point of the parcel, and it's a much smaller lot. So the parcel actually does not have a backyard, uh, so they use, the applicants use their, their front yard as their backyard. And if the variance was not approved and they had to take down the wall, it would actually um, be, more of a, to be more of an issue of safety for the, for the property owner, as uh, the wall provides privacy and it's a crime deterrent and so on. Um, specifically on the Santa Ana side, there's no vegetative buffer along Playa Court, as many of the other parcels in the area do have that vegetative buffer for security and privacy. Um, as I mentioned, the wall is a deterrent for crime. Um, in summer of 2007, there actually was um, a shooting in the area, and it actually um, produced bullet holes in the applicant's uh, dwelling. So the applicant wants the wall there so that won't happen or it at least deter it from happening. And as I mentioned, Public Works um, went out to the site and they determined that even though the, the wall is within the clear site triangle, it, there is no view obstruction. So just to give you um, a general look of what the surrounding area is, this is a assessor's parcel map on my left of the area that that um, I have mentioned before is the 78 parcels. The yellow uh, color parcel is the subject property. You can see very distinctly that it's triangular in size or in design. Uh, the two orange parcels are represented here in these pictures. Um, and as you can see, the top photo has, it is also uh, an irregularly shaped lot, but they do meet the setbacks in the front of 20 feet and they do have a three foot wall. Uh, and then the bottom photo is um, representing the same thing that they do have. They do meet this front setback and they also have a vegetative buffer. So the recommended actions are here on the screen. I'm not going to read them to you, but uh, I just want to remind uh, the commission that you have the option of either um, go uh, either going with the recommended actions of the planning division or denying the, um, the variance. So if the variance was to be denied, then the applicant would, would have to either, uh, the applicant would have to remove the wall and demol dem demolish the wall, and then they wouldn't have any of the privacy that um, is afforded to the other parcels in the area. So again, we have um, staff here from the Public Works Department, and Transportation and Code Compliance staff to answer any questions you may have specifically about uh, the violations and the site triangle. Before we have questions, uh, we'll have uh, disclosures by uh, the commission. At this time, I would like to ask each planning commissioner to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that is not already contained in the record before us on this matter. Please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. I'll start to my left, Commissioner Rodriguez. Any disclosures? Uh, yes. Um, I'm a resident of Silver Strand. Um, so it was easy for me to go by and see the property driven past it a number of times over the years. Um, I did that before I received the staff reports with the PowerPoint presentation, et cetera, with the pictures, et cetera. And so I was able to look at it 
um, actually s snap some pictures for my for my uh, purposes, um, not unlike what's in in the staff presentation. Um, I did that last week. Thank you, Commissioner King. Although I have no ex parte, uh, I did speak with staff and request and get a copy of the February 11, 2008 um, memo sent to Dr. Cowan uh, by staff. I have a copy of it here, so I'm not, uh, that wasn't in the record and I'm disclosing that I did in fact get it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner McPhail. None whatsoever. <laughs> Go ahead. I have no disclosure. I have no disclosures either. Okay, any questions of staff at this point? Yes, Commissioner King. Yes, I have a question. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, absolutely. I have a question as it relates to the wall fronting on uh, Playa, Playa Court. Um, as I said, I, was, I drove by there. I saw it, even stopped, took some pictures, and never got out of the vehicle. Um, What is the length of the front wall? That, that butts up against basically the driveway. Commissioner Rodriguez. Um, there is a, an exhibit in the staff report. Um, it is exhibit four, and it's the site plan for the existing wall. The length of the property is 71 feet. 71 feet from the corner of the wall to the edge of the driveway? The length of the, pro that's the length of the parcel. I can get more information about the actual length of the wall. It, um, momentarily, or the applicant can also um, answer that question for you. Can we move on? Come back to that? Yeah, we can move on. Okay. Go ahead, Commissioner King. Uh, Commissioner Rodriguez, I'm sorry, Commissioner Rodriguez, um, on the applicant's site plan, it shows the delineation of the wall as it rely, as it as it's uh, indicated on Playa Court. As Christina had mentioned, Playa Court, the property line is approximately 71 feet long, and it appears that the wall is roughly 35, 40 feet in length as it is on Playa Court. Now it goes at a diagonal and then cuts north on Santa Ana Avenue, and it takes pretty much the whole length of Santa Ana Avenue, which is 85 feet in length. Right, I understood that. I was, my question was about the actual frontage on Playa uh, Plaza, and you've just answered my question, thank you. Okay, third time's the charm, Commissioner King. Thank you. <clears throat> Several, I think some of these questions really call the um, public works representative who I understand is here. Is that correct? Perfect. Um, I'm Gerald Weeks Jr. I'm the permits engineer. I, I manage the permit section for the transportation department. Thank okay. you. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Sure. Um, I'm trying to understand the geometry of a clear site triangle as it relates to how the position of this wall does not interfere with the clear sight triangle. So if you could, you know, maybe pull up a slide and, and, and show that to me, I would ha appreciate that. I'll attempt to describe it to you. There have been a lot of discussions about triangles in our office. Uh, the, um, for the coastal zone, for the coastal zoning ordinance, the um, clear sight triangle is at a non-stop controlled intersection or at a stop controlled intersection, I'm sorry. Um, the site triangle is defined by AASHTO. And so that triangle is a 
different shape than the one, the exhibit you've been referring to. The shape of that triangle is 14 and a half feet back from the edge of the travel way and it's 280 feet to the, to the right, uh, or, yeah, in the west direction for eastbound traffic. So the, the clear sight triangle that's been referred to here, the 40 by 40, that's where there's no stop sign at the intersection. So at this intersection, there's a stop sign on La Playa Court. Also, in addition to the fact that it's um, 280 feet away and 14 and a half feet back, we posted it no, no parking along that uh, portion of the road. So if you do the measurements from the edge of the travel way, you come back 14 and a half feet, you're maybe five or six feet behind the stop bar and then uh, you have the ability to inch forward. Um, you also have what basically the width of a parking lane along that roadway. So you have an additional six and a half or eight feet of space in order to inch forward. So the, the, the sight triangle for the critical direction, which is to the right, looking west for eastbound traffic, that's 14 and a half feet um, on one leg and it's 280 feet in the other direction. So, it, and that's because we, the coastal zoning ordinance uses the AASHTO standard for a stop controlled intersection. And the stop sign is on the minor road, which is La Playa Court. Okay, I noticed that the stop sign is set back from where normally you would see it at a stop controlled intersection. Mm -hmm. um, what drove the decision to move that back? Was it the installation of the wall or was it always there before the wall was there? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. Um, the, the sign is usually set in the, about the same location as the stop bar. And I, I can, I don't know if I have a picture of that. Um, let me see if I have a photo. Oh, that's not it. Do you have a photo? So that would that would have to be addressed by the traffic engineer. Um, it we can certainly look at the location of that stop sign. Um, legally, anyone that comes to the intersection they have to stop behind the stop bar. So um, they can do that and then they, they have plenty of sight distance as they inch forward into the intersection. Um, the reason for the stop sign being there, I, I don't have a good answer for that one, I'm sorry. Okay. Um. What happens if that stop sign at some point gets replaced by a signal light? How does that change everything? If there were a signal light, then all legs of the intersection would stop. And then the sight distance triangles get much smaller. Oh, it gets because everyone is, is stopping, yeah. The, the, the reason for the larger triangles is due to whether the individual is going to stop or yield. Um, in this case, everyone is stopping at, at the intersection as they're approaching, is it Harbor Boulevard? As they approach Harbor Boulevard. So that's, that's the, the, the reason for the shapes of the triangles. Okay, thank you. Oh. And I have one other question for um, the staff, and that is, um, in the original pre-application, uh, Dr. Cowan uh, cited the fact that one of the uh, triangular properties had a six foot high wooden fence. In the exhibits that I saw of the other triangular properties, I didn't see a wooden fence there anymore. What happened to it? I'll have to defer to Mr. Dr. Cowan. I have no idea. I mean, it's a wood fence. It very well could have been removed um, okay. by that property owner. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Any questions on this side? Commissioner McPhail. Uh, this question is probably for staff. Was the wall there when the applicant bought the property in 204? Was it six feet already? From what I read, it sounded like the wall was already there when they bought the property. Uh, Commissioner McPhail, yes, the wall was there when the applicant bought the property in 2004. Okay. And then uh, if you put the site triangle back up there, please. Sorry about that. And, and maybe this is a question from the gentleman uh, from Public Works. Okay. Uh, the subject property is on the right. There's a house across the street on the left and up that's right next to Harbor Boulevard also. <clears throat> it seems to me that that house blocks the view more so than the applicant's property. If you're looking at cars coming from the east to west so looking in the left or <clears throat> easterly direction for westbound traffic hope you understood all that the the shape of that triangle is 14 and a half feet back from the traveled way and then it's 240 feet down the street and because the street is curved you can actually see more of the vehicles uh, you can see further this house here. Yeah, that, the house, if the you, house is if not. If you want to look to the left, you have to ease out. Otherwise, you can't see anybody coming that direction. So the only obstruction to site visibility that we could see was some bushes that are along the edge of the, the curb there. And those are all very low. So if that house wasn't there, this house would actually provide better looking east well, in our than, than the other one if it wasn't there well the road is curved i don't know if it's curving yeah, up it's, so it's exist, curved up yeah yeah um it's a shorter distance because that that's uh so the critical movement is if you're at the stop sign you're turning left and you're looking to the right that's the critical movement that's the 14 and a half by 280 so if you're if you're turning right in the west direction you're looking to the left mm -hmm. Um, the critical triangle is 14 and a half by 240. It's a little shorter, but you can actually see most of that road because of the curve in the road. And the, it's also a low speed road. It's, a, it's 25 miles per hour is the speed limit. So um, there shouldn't be any site visibility issues in either direction. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Commissioner Rodriguez? Uh, as I, as I uh, interpreted what the speaker just said about the site picture, triangular, uh, triangular um, looking, to, looking to the right, being on Playa, uh, coming up to that stop sign, and looking to the right, the measurement was taken approximately five, six feet back from the limit line is what I heard you say, uh, looking to the right. And, and I, the stop sign certainly is back from that. However, the limit line is where legally and technically you have to stop. And so if you move up to that limit line, as in I think what you were saying, when, when you look to the right and see what the distance is, um, I've been there. Um, it's more than adequate. And and looking to the left, uh, because of the way the road comes into that and passes by that intersection, um, there's way way plenty of uh, vision. It's not an ob It's vision is not obstructed on traffic moving left to right on that intersection. Um, <clears throat> the house across the street, the vegetation is low and it doesn't impede it, as, as I recall when I drove by there last week. It, and I think that's what you're saying also. Yes, and I've looked at photos. The traffic engineer actually went to the site and he looked at site visibility and Thank he you. determined that there was no site visibility um, 
Yes, she is. I hope I'm saying that correctly. It, the, in our opinion, the site, the wall is not in the site, the site triangle, because the site triangle is defined by ASHTO, and it's 14 and a half feet by 280. And that's for a stop controlled intersection. Okay, one last question. Are, were there any accidents? Do we have a, a history of accidents at this uh, intersection? I have no knowledge of the accidents. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Now I will open the public hearing, and um, do I have any speaker cards on this? No cards? Okay. Commission, well, go ahead here. Sorry, Commissioner Idukas. Um, Dr. Cowan forgot to fill out a speaker slip and he would like to say a few words. Dr. Cowan is the applicant. We'll get you a speaker card, Anna. Sorry, I didn't know I was supposed to have a speaker card. Good morning. So I just have about a 64 page prepared statement to read into the record and I'm kidding. I don't have any prepared statement. Please um, state your name. I'm Robert Cowan. And your city of residence. Yes, uh, Oxnard. So um, I just mostly wanted to acknowledge my gratitude to the group for uh, all of their work in doing this. This was a potentially very painful process, and there was some pain, I, I will acknowledge. But from the time I started with Mr. Lagunas, uh, through working with Ms. Welch and Ms. Boero and Mr. Weeks, it's, it's been an education, and I'm very grateful for now. I, having a much better understanding of what goes into a, a wall. No political intent there. Um, it's um, been a long process, obviously, starting all the way back to 2010, and we didn't understand all that was involved. I didn't know there was such a thing as a, as a, a site triangle. And uh, so in answer to your, your, your questions, Ms. Idukas, was um, there's not been an accident at that corner on our side, but the house across the street did have a car crash into the house coming from the east way too fast. Not so, relevant. Yeah, so that, that really wasn't relevant. The shooting was a big deal. Um, we had bullets into the house, into my daughter's bedroom, and that was actually the major motivation for, uh, for the wall, um, you know, replacing some of the glass with concrete. Um, she was just afraid to go outside without it. Um, there have been, you know, thefts, and, you know, it's a high traffic area. Uh, so it has afforded us a, a much safer environment. And um, as I said, we, we can't really go outside um, without, that, without that front area. We don't have a, an area anywhere else. Other than that, I, I'm happy to answer any, any questions um, there, um, that you might have. Um, but otherwise, I think the, the statement is prepared uh, by Ms. Boero really does describe the situation and, and the reasons for requesting the variance. Thank you. Are there any questions? Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, if I understand correctly, I don't know if you're the right one to answer the question or whether staff is uh, looked like on the history that a notice of violation for this wall was issued in 2008 and the application for a variance to, to allow the wall was filed 10 years later. And my question would be, wh why did it take 10 years uh, yes. for the variance application to happen? Yeah, I, I think I, I probably should answer that. Um, so we didn't understand the process and we thought that when we requested the variance that that was a fait accompli. We had said we wanted a variance. We never heard another response, and we don't know. We were having issues with uh, mail being stolen, uh, but we didn't know that over the next 10 years we were actually in violation that um, fines were being levied and eventually an actual um, lien was placed on, on, on the property. The only way we found that out was when we had applied for an equity line to do some remodeling and we were informed that there was a lien on. That was in 2010. We immediately started to investigate. It was my first visit um, to the planning office. Um, 
We found out about all of these, uh, these fines and late fees. Um, we paid them. Um, Mr. Lagunas helped walk me through what had to happen at that point. So as soon as we were aware, we made it. But we had no, no knowledge that this was going on for basically 10 years. It's not saying we shouldn't have. I'm just saying that we didn't. We didn't know. Is that right, staff? Um, that is correct. I just want to point out that, uh, as you know, we have uh, civil administrative penalties here in the, the both the non-coastal and coastal zoning ordinance. On, um, so in the case of the coastal zoning ordinance, the civil administrative penalties, which would have alerted um, Dr. Cowan to the fact that there was still a violation um, because daily fines would be um, added, um, at, at the point of after the notice of no compliance of non-compliance is issued That is not the case for this pro this specific project because the coastal zoning ordinance only adopted the civil administrative penalties in 2017 So he was stuck in that um, That area of not having not knowing we also have co code compliance staff here to answer that question more fully if you need it Any other questions of the speaker? Commissioner King? Yes. Uh, <laughs> when I was by there the other day, uh, and I asked a question about the front wall on uh, the plaza, um, it's not block or concrete uh, six feet high, the length of that wall. There appears to be plexiglass or something um, part way through. I'm assuming it's about four to three to four feet high um, with a with the block beneath it and the glass allow a visual into the yard. Yes. That's not going to change. No, no, we have no plans to make to make any changes. The reason for the glass is to allow a safer, safer egress from the driveway so that we can see, see cars coming. But no, we have no plans to change that. And it's, it's shatterproof glass. Correct. And as I recall, having gone through this easement issue um, personally and in, in, in general with, with the beach community, um, when we bought or done things to the houses and replaced fences, we just put them back where they were before. And uh, as maybe happened in the rear of, the, of this property, since it used to be a wooden fence, uh, without consciously knowing that there's a limit on the frontage, it's, it's six feet on, on the rear and, and six feet high on the rear on both sides, which this appears to be. But when a contractor comes in and puts in a block wall, he puts it in based on your specs that they're given. And it's not unusual if a block wall is six feet in the front or a fence was six feet in the front and it's replaced, that the replacement is six feet high. The reality is the code requires, uh, says three feet, and that's for uh, safety purposes, among other things. Uh, visual. For, for public safety and that type of stuff. So I'm glad to see that you've got the uh, the uh, plexiglass or whatever that is that mm. allows you to see in and out, and it is a safety issue. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cowan, is it your testimony that you never received the February 11th, 2008 uh, memo from uh, Nancy Butler Francis uh, at the County Resource Management Agency? Yes, first time I saw that was when Mr. Laguna showed it to me when I came to inquire what the lien was about. Okay. That's fine. And you never received any written notice of any uh, fines being recorded and liens being recorded against the property in the mail? No. Okay, and thank you. And is it staff's testimony that the notices were never sent that uh, liens were being recorded? Uh, first, I wanna mention that 
I, as I heard Dr. Cowan say, he did have some issues with mail theft, okay? He had some issues with mail theft. Now, I'm not saying the correspondence from Nancy Francis was subject to mail theft, but he did testify that he had issues with that. Now, we have to assume that our mail is being delivered accordingly, and so, you know, Ms. Francis did respond to the inquiry that Dr. Cowan had to request a variance. As Christina had mentioned, our local coastal program was recently amended to clarify the civil administrative penalties process, okay? And that process is a notification process before you go into the formality of a formal notice of violation and then civil administrative penalties. Now that amendment was adopted and later certified in 2017. What Christina was saying was Dr. Cowan got the notice of violation, I'm not sure why he wasn't informed about that notice of violation, but civil administrative penalties would not have been assessed until and unless 2017. Now, we do have someone here from Code Enforcement, and from my understanding, they're trying to resurrect some of these legacy cases, which Dr. Cowan's potentially was. And the fact that Dr. Cowan was trying to get a lien or a loan for another project, this was obstructing that because he had this notice of violation on his preliminary title report on title. To rectify that, he has to abate the violation to remove that notice of violation. As to assessing fines and those kind of things, I'll have to defer to code, code compliance. Okay, well, I'm less concerned with that. I just wanna know if the variance is granted, does all that go away? Yes, it's a way to a remedy and abate the situation. Okay, thank you. Does that mean I get my $7,000 in fines back? I'll have to defer to code enforcement as to where those fines I mean, were that would assessed. be lovely, but as I said, we didn't know. That's not within our purview. Right. So um, are there any other questions of the speaker? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Um, are there any other speakers on this matter? I don't have any other cards, any cards at all. Um, I'll close the public hearing and uh, we can have closing comments by staff or someone can make a motion. Commissioner McPhail. Mr. Rodriguez. Commissioner a Rodriguez. I'd make a motion to follow staff recommendation. Second. Okay. Are there, is there any discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. Thank you very much. Moving on to our next item, which I don't think you want to stick around for. You might want to. Um, fill out a, a card before you leave, sir, Dr. Cohen. Please fill out a speaker card just for our records. Our next item is thank you very much for um, coming to the hearing and giving us uh, Help. Case number PL18 0146, Help of Ojai. Good morning, Chair Dukas and Good members morning. of the commission. Before I get started on my presentation, I would like to point out. And uh, a typo that were uh, that was included on the, the conditions of approval that was graciously pointed out by Commissioner King. Um, it is um, condition number 15, and it is uh, the consultant review and information and consultant work. There is a paragraph, introductory paragraph that was omitted from the, the conditions, and they will be replaced with the standard condition language. Um, that will be included in the in the in the agenda or the the minutes. My name is Justin Bertline, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm a case planner with the RMA Planning Division. Uh, the item before your commission today is case number PL180146, and the request is for the approval of a continuation permit that would allow for the continued legal non-conforming operation of Help of Ojai at the former uh, Ventura County Sheriff's Jail uh, Branch Facility 
more commonly known as the Honor Farm. The project site is located at 370 West Baldwin Road in the Ojai Valley area in the unincorporated area of Ventura County. The site has a general plan land use designation of open space and is zoned open space 40 acre minimum parcel size. The parcel or the subject property is bounded to the north, to the west, and to the south by the Ventura River and residential development to the northeast, the east, and the southeast. The project site is approximately 112 acres in size and is comprised of two legal lots. Highway 150 dissects these two legal lots and the area that is subject to consideration for the continuation permit request is a 42 acre part, uh, portion of the legal lot that sits south of Baldwin Road. So the property was acquired by Ventura County in 1929 and the county opened the Honor Farm Jail facility in 1939. The, the area is um, developed with approximately 91,000 square feet of facilities and structures, all of which were authorized through appropriate zoning ordinance requirements and conditional use permits. The facility or the, uh, the property operated as a jail facility from 1939 to 2003 when the county shut down the operation due to rising operational costs. The property sat vacant for approximately three years until the county board of supervisors um, executed a 35 year lease agreement with the help of Ojai to change the use or to retrofit the, the jail facility um, to a community center. In 2007, your planning commission uh, authorized conditional use permit LU 060160, which authorized the conversion of the jail facility to a community center for a period of 10 years. In 2010, the County Board of Supervisors approved Ordinance Amendment 4411. This ordinance amendment rendered the community center as a non-compatible use within the open space zone. At that time, the board identified that approval of this ordinance amendment would have impacts to existing approved facilities within the open space zone. Because of this, the board established a procedure that would allow for the continued legal non-conforming uses uh, to be authorized through the issuance of a continuation permit. So with the help of Ojai continue to operate under their existing CUP, and in, in 2018, uh, county staff identified that this permit had expired in 2017. At that time, the help of Ojai and the county entered into a compliance agreement which authorized the continued use of the property and required the help of Ojai to submit an application for a continuation permit. That application was received in 2018, and this is the um, item for your consideration today. So as I mentioned, the request is for the approval of a continuation permit to allow for uh, the continued use of Help of Ojai for the Honor Farm Jail facility. Help of Ojai is a Section 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide uh, the basic unmet needs of the underserved population of the Ojai Valley area. The applicant is requesting that this permit be approved for 22 years so that the expiration date of this permit coincides with that of the approved uh, lease. No new development, expansion of use, or structures are proposed as part of this application. This is the approved site plan for the underlying CUP. And as I mentioned, no new development or expansion of use is proposed. And this is the proposed site plan for this continuation permit as well. So the following are some site photos of what the uh, is currently being, the site is currently being used for. This support center building is the main administration, main administrative offices for the Help of Ojai's West Campus. The Help of Ojai's Senior Nutrition Program is ran out of this building. In this, in this, com in this commercial kitchen, staff and volunteers prepare meals for Ojai Valley residents five days a week. These meals are available for dine-in or delivery services. There's a donation center on site Residents can drop off unwanted goods and clothing. Those items are sorted and then taken to a retail facility in downtown Ojai. Help of Ojai also serves as an umbrella organization which oversees the subleasing of buildings to uh, associated nonprofits. All subleases must be reviewed and approved by the county CEO's office and those subleases have to, their mission statement has to align to that of the Help of Ojai. This building is occupied by the Ojai Valley Land Conservancy, whose mission is to protect and preserve the 
open space and wildlife areas of the Ohio Valley. The Ohio Raptor Center also leases a, a building on the facility, um, and they rehabilitate displaced animals, not solely raptors, but any kind of wildlife displaced by wildfires or injured. Um, they re rehabilitate them and release them back into the wild. They also offer some educational opportunities on this site. Uh, this building is leased by the crew of Ojai, who provides job opportunity to, opportunities to Ojai Valley youth, and they provide environmental services such as uh, fire abatement, uh, weed clearing, things of that nature. There are also approximately 11 acres of crop production on the facility. Uh, these, this land is leased by Steve Sprinkle, who is the co-owner of uh, the Farmer and the Cook restaurant in Ojai. This is an organic crop production, and all of the uh, Crops grown here are used at the, at the restaurant. Sometimes the overflow, if they have ex excess uh, crops, they will go to uh, the senior nutrition program. So in addition to the help of Ojai and the subleases that exist on the property, there are many unused buildings um, that are just remnants from the jail facility. A lot of these, like this maximum security center, are really unusable for any kind of administrative offices or anything like that. So they're just unused at this point. So in order for staff to make a recommendation of approval for a continuation permit, the following uh, findings have to be met. That special circumstances apply to any use or structure does not apply to any other use or structure in the same uh, zone. And that the continuance is not detrimental to the public interest, health, safety, convenience, or welfare and that the applicant filed, time, filed a timely application for a continuation permit prior to, the issue, prior to the expiration of the underlying conditional use permit. These findings are described in detail in section C of the staff report, but they are summarized here. Help of Ojai is unique in that is, there are other uh, nonprofits that exist within the area, but Help of Ojai consolidates a number of nonprofits that operate as a community center. The help of Ojai improves the welfare of the community of Ojai Valley uh, by, through employment and um, services uh, and assistance to the disadvantaged population of that area. Uh, we have conducted research of the property and the help of Ojai and determined that in their 11 year existence at the site, there is no violations issued or no complaints received by any of the neighbors. There is a compliance agreement, as I mentioned, that was entered into between the county and the help of Ojai that authorized the continued use of this facility and required them to submit an application for a continuation permit. And that continuation permit application was received in December 2006, which was within the parameters of their, uh, their compliance agreement. So staff's recommended actions are included in section E of your staff report. And we ask that your, staff, your commission take into consideration any testimony or evidence provided here today. And this concludes my presentation. I'm available for any uh, questions or comments your commission may have. Um, before we have uh, questions, I'll just ask for uh, disclosures again. I won't read this again. Starting to my right, Commissioner White, any disclosures? I have no disclosures. Commissioner McDale? Uh, I was there several months ago for the open house for the uh, bird rescue. That's the only time I've been on the site. Thank you. Commissioner King? No disclosure. Commissioner Rodriguez? I used to work out there. Um, the last time I was probably on the site was probably 20 years ago. I'm very familiar with the, with the grounds. Thank you. Thank you. And I have no disclosures. Are there any questions? Any questions of staff? Commissioner White? Uh, have there been any problems uh, or complaints? Uh, Commissioner White, we did our research and there was no complaints received. We do have complaint logs um, and none of it, there was no violations uh, in addition to that. Any other questions? Commissioner King. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bertoline, uh, you and I discussed this, um, and so I think this is going to go to uh, County Council. Um, but I was questioning a lot of conditions, particularly Condition 6, 
and 29 through 33 and 36 that seem to relate to activities that are not involved in, um, in legal non-conforming use. If I understand the application, the legal non-conforming use at question is the uh, community center. Correct. All these other things have to do with construction, demolition, uh, vehicle equipment and maintenance, battery storage, uh, equi equipment engine tuning. It seems to me that all of these conditions are superfluous to the uh, continuation application before us. Now, you indicated that it was county council that asked those be placed back in. Is that correct? Um, partially. So the uh, some of the, the conditions, in particular number six, that uh, references build any kind of uh, future proposed building or construction, um, because it's a it's a non-conforming use. The the zoning ordinance um, none of the zoning ordinance requ uh, requirements apply to this. So the underlying document. The guidance document would be this continuation permit. So, if they ever would come in for a, a proposed modification to one of the existing buildings, they would have to refer back to this continuation permit and the, and the conditions that are associated with that for their guidance. So, if they would have to modify the building, they would have to adhere to these conditions. Um, as far as the other, um, the battery storage, the vehicle storage, they they do um, have their transportation services there where they provide meals for um, the Ojai Valley residents. So they do have vehicles that are stored on site. So I, I believe that any kind of um, vehicle storage that would trigger these conditions from the transportation or environmental health division. And that's why I believe those conditions are imposed on this project. And maybe Jeff can allude to a little bit more of why the um, how the, con the, the continuation permit differs from the zoning ordinance. Are you saying that all these other activities were also legal non-conforming uses approved by the prior uh, uh, permit? Yes, so they were, at the time they were illegal, they were conforming uses, but since it's a continuation permit, there's no change to the previously approved permit, so we have to carry over a lot of the conditions that, ap that apply to the last uh, permit. Okay. Yeah, I, I, my only concern, and, and uh, Mr. Barnes might be able to address this, is if the concern is that if at some point, say, they have to repair a building because some of them look a little worse for wear, that this will somehow alert staff that they can address these improvements to these, quote, non-conforming uses. Is that the, uh, Ms. Barnes, is that the, uh, is that the reason for including these uh, conditions? Yes, yeah, exactly. They're, they're basically advisories um, alerting the permittee that if they want to do certain things that are associated with the, um, the, the, the permitted use, which is, which is broad. It's, it's a community center, but a lot of different things go on there. And it's basically advisory that you have to follow these rules or <clears throat> you have to pull a zoning clearance or whatnot. So each condition should relate to, <clears throat> excuse me, activities that are either occurring now or um, in terms of c construction could occur in the future within the auspice of the, the larger community center use. Okay, well I guess what I understood was because any of these activities would require an application, uh, discretionary or otherwise, and would come with its own set of conditions which, which would probably mirror what's listed here. So the question kind of became, well, you know, why do we need them both? I'm, I'm questioning whether as a way of notifying staff that they have to give consideration, That's, that might not be a real wise way to go. If it's only notifying the applicant, well, the applicant's gonna have to get a permit anyway. Well, and, and I, I don't know the specifics. I mean, so the construction, you know, you know, as been mentioned, there's a lot of old buildings, and so presumably they are going to have to do maintenance. And so that, that seems like a reasonable advisory. You need a zoning clearance to, you know, to modify these buildings. Not, and, and you're right, they would need a new permit to expand, but if they're just going to modify, then they would need a zoning clearance. So 
that, that to me seems appropriate. Um, in terms of the vehicle and equipment maintenance and the battery storage conditions, um, I defer to um, Mr. Bertaline on that, but my understanding is that they, they do have vehicles there and they, they have a recycling center that could involve batteries. And so my understanding is that those conditions do relate to the existing use. And so it's not like it, this would be something new where they would need a new permit. It's, my understanding is they're already doing this stuff and so these, these conditions tell them how they're supposed to conduct those existing activities. Okay, thank you. I'm only raising all these issues because I'm, I'm not a fan of superfluous conditions. If the conditions make sense, fine. But if they're just boilerplate conditions, I'm, I'm just not a fan, especially for an organization that's doing the good work that this organization is. Let's don't burden, burden them more than we have to. But if there's a good reason for it, that's fine. I would support it. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank Do you. we have any speaker cards on this? I saw that we had um, statement cards, which we read. Um, if I could have those back, and then I'll. Oh, okay. Um, so it looks like there doesn't need to be um, anything further. Uh, I'll open and close the public hearing unless someone wants to speak. Okay, so uh, now we just have, uh, uh, yes, go ahead. So we, <clears throat> now's the time to speak. Okay, um, <clears throat> when I first saw that facility, it was the Honor Farm and, and what I remember is uh, they were famous for raising pigs and slaughtering them. Um, it is wonderful to see the transformation that has taken place there into it being now a, a community-oriented center for nonprofits that are doing amazing work in the Ojai Valley. And I know I look around the audience here and see some of the, the famous movers and shakers in the Ojai Valley who, who, uh, who do wonderful work. Um, including Help of Ojai, the Ojai Valley Land Conservancy, CREW, which is Concerned Resource Environmental Workers, the Ojai Raptor Center, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, uh, a community center, a donation center, 11 acres of organic farms, uh, senior nutrition. Uh, there are probably things I haven't touched on, but um, certainly the, the county and the planning commission now uh, needs to support this. We've heard from staff there are no, nobody's uh, fighting this, nobody's complaining about it. I think um, it's, it's pretty obvious we need to approve the staff recommendation and I would move that we do so. We have a motion, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion before we vote? Okay. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda. <coughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Report by the planning director on board matters and board actions and other matters. Good morning again, members of the planning commission. My name is Jennifer Welch. I'm sitting in for Kim Prohart and I'm gonna brief you on what's coming up on your agendas. Um, the planning division didn't have anything recently at the board, um, but that's not to say that we won't be going to the board Clearly, the general plan update team is gearing up for those workshops. But your workshops will begin June 6th with the general plan update team. Isn't there a, an appeal of a notice of violation coming up that the board is going to hear? Uh, let me see. The winery. So we have. That's board, right? That's in front of the board. June 18th, that's okay. correct, June right. 18th. So that's a, a, a further down the road, and that would be the Old Creek Winery gotcha. appeal. Gotcha. Um, and then uh, we have another one um, 
the work session on September 10th for the sea level rise before the board. So that's way in advance. So um, for the Planning Commission, we don't have anything on the agenda for May, but we do have that general plan update project on your calendar for June 6th, 13th, and 20th. And that is all I have on the calendar for you. Thank you. Moving on, uh, this is items Planning Commission may wish to introduce. Um, I thought you had something. Yeah, I have. I have a question on the County of Ventura General Plan 2018 Annual Progress Report. And uh, reading it, I, I get, I'm a little bit confused. I know we don't vote before you send it off to Sacramento and all the different departments to get a copy of it. But what concerned me was uh, the discussion on AB 879 and SB 35 with the governor's new edict, if you don't meet your state mandated goals, they're gonna withdraw a uh, gas tax. And my concern is with the exceptions in both of those bills about prime ag land and several different other categories that we obviously fall into and the report states that basically we're talking the Satakoy general area for development. Uh, Will this report sway anybody in Sacramento to not take our gas tax away, in your opinion? I, I, sorry, I don't have an opinion with that. All, our job is to disclose all the information, not to sway anybody's decision, but just to disclose that information. Okay, I guess my request is if we hear anything that they want to withdraw or withhold some of our gas tax money, I'd like to know about it. Absolutely. And maybe I'll, I'll chime in on that. Um, there's a couple different layers there. Um, in terms of Sacramento and taking away local gas tax money, my understanding is that's not a done deal yet. Sacramento's gotten a lot of pushback, and so there's no law or, my understanding, legal authorization that would allow Sacramento to do that. Um, and the second part is just more, more generally with the general plan update, the, the county is absolutely looking at, um, at um, the county's ability to, to provide adequate land for housing. And so that, that's already built into the county's um, state approved housing element. And, um, and so that, I think that was approved two years ago. The, the next housing element, element doesn't need to be approved for a few more years. But my understanding is we're on track to meet our, um, our targets right now. And so, um, so that, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, lack of land for, for housing shouldn't really be an issue in this general plan cycle. Um, but I'm sure the um, planning department will go into more detail when, when the draft general plan is presented. Yeah, I, I understand that part. And I understand that it's not a done deal. But uh, having in my previous life, uh, being the Ag Commissioner, we got unclaimed gas tax money every year, as your office knows. And my concern is that was in, that's in law. But I have a problem with the makeup of our legislature may go along with the governor on this issue, and I just have a problem with that. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I can assure you that the um the, the planning division has their eyes on that specific issue, and it was it was addressed in a, um, I want to say last month, the um, planning division presented um, an annual um, update on the general plan and implementation to the board, and so that went into housing, and so that issue was addressed. Um, I'd be happy to send you a copy of that board letter, but that's absolutely on the county's radar. I think we... We, we have the report that's going to Sacramento, and, and according to the graphs and stuff, you, you're, you're correct. We're, we're going in the right direction, but like I said, my concern is what Sacramento may or may not do, and I just like to keep abreast of what's happening. I know it'll be in the paper and, and stuff like that, but I, if, if it does come to fruition, I'd like to know how it's going to affect this county. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, we'll keep our eye on that. Thank you. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Is there anything else? 
Oh, actually, I have, um, I'm sorry, I have a litigation update. I thought you'd, you'd be interested in, in a few items. Um, yesterday, uh, we received word, or and, and actually an opinion from the, um, the state appellate court. Um, some of you are, are aware of this project. Um, to, I guess just two of you now as, as time passes, but the county approved an oil and gas project uh, referred to as a Ferndale project near Thomas Aquinas College in 2015, and um, the county was subsequently sued under CEQA. We won in the, um, the trial court, and yesterday we found out we won in the appellate court. And so um, we successfully de defended the county's project approval in that lawsuit. Um, and in terms of the wildlife corridor ordinance, this was not unexpected. We received one challenge to the ordinance uh, from, from Colab, and we're expecting to receive another challenge um, from a mining industry group. Those are petitions for writ of mandate, which um, have been filed in the Superior Court. The, the Colab petition was served on us, and we expect to receive the uh, mining industry petition in the next couple days. So um, again, not, not unexpected, and so we'll, we'll defend the uh, wildlife corridor ordinance um, from those legal challenges. Thank you. Okay, this meeting is adjourned.